Good morning, church. Good, Good morning. morning. Mary and Greg and I, we are just delighted to be with you this morning. Uh, we wish you all a very blessed Sabbath. We are pleased that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. Greg, would you pray for God's blessings on this morning's day? It would be my pleasure. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a beautiful Sabbath morning and for the opportunity to come together to study your word. Lord, we ask and pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit to guide and direct each of us, Lord. May every word that comes out of our mouths be from you through your Holy Spirit and to please bless and anoint the ears of all of those who are listening with us, Lord. Help us to take the lessons that you have for us, to apply them to our hearts and minds, and to share with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Greg. This quarter's lessons look at Deuteronomy topically. These cover such themes as the everlasting covenant, law and grace, what it means to love God and our neighbor, and most important of all, our Deuteronomy reveals to us the love of God, which was most powerfully made manifest in the death of Jesus on the cross and uh, his resurrection. This week's Sabbath School lesson is titled, Turn Their Hearts. In reality, in reality, what that means is consider repentance. The memory task, text is found in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 29, Deuteronomy 4:29, And I want to read that for you. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, as, as a brief summary of what this particular verse is telling us, um, I, I want to state that as we read in Scripture, Christianity calls for all that a human being is and has, the mind, the affection, and the, cap the capacity to action. The memory verse, which is found, as we read in uh, chapter 4, uh, verses 29 of Deuteronomy, urges us to, to do two significant things. To love him with all our heart. So what does that mean? The Hebrew word used here for heart generally reflects um, and refers to the motives, the affections, the feelings, the desires, and the will. In Scripture, the heart is the source of action and the center of thought and feeling. But that verse also tells us to love the Lord with all our soul. The Hebrew word for soul here indicates our being, our life, who we are. So in other words, the physical being, the spiritual being, the mind, our bodily appetites and desires. And uh, it really means when God says that he wants our heart and our minds, he wants us all. He wants the entire being. Amen. A brief overview of this week's Sabbath School lesson. Romans chapters 3, verses 10 and 23 tell us, tells us that there is none righteous. No, not one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So everyone that has lived after Adam and Eve has all sinned. It is just a fact, therefore, that we are all sinful. As the Israelites were about to enter the promised land, Moses pleads with them to be faithful. He tells them that if they are going to be unfaithful, they will be vomited from the land just as God did to the nations that occupied it before them. Here is how Moses writes in Leviticus, uh, in Leviticus chapter 18, um, um, how, the, how this would fit. Leviticus 18 verses 25, 26, and 28. For the land is defiled. 
Therefore I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants. Verses 26. You shall therefore keep my statues and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, either any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells among you. Verse 28. Lest the land vomit you out also when you defile it, just as it vomited out the nations that were before you. In the basis of the covenant relationship that God established with Israel, God's people held title to the promised land. You and I hold title to the promised land in that covenant. If they violated the covenant, they forfeited the right to remain in Canaan. They would be plucked from off the land and scattered. The scripture that uh, we have just read in Leviticus chapter 18 suggests and teaches that God's people have a constant need to seek God and seek repentance. Just as the land repents and returns its inhabitants, they will have to repent in order to return to the land and remain in the land. Moses was concerned. He was concerned that as the Israelites were settling in the promised land, that they may be tempted to think that they had reached their destination and did not need to be careful anymore. He was concerned that little by little they may lose touch with God and the demands of His law, thinking that they had arrived at their destination and could venture outside the old pathway. This is precisely what happens to the people who are deceived by false beliefs, false teachings, and false prophets. These false beliefs, false teachings, and false prophets often provide the illusion of peace. This is exactly what has happened and was happening to Israel during Jeremiah's time. So in Jeremiah chapter 6, six verses 14, the Lord, the, the Lord warns against it. And he, he warns his people and tells them that the false prophets and the false beliefs and the false teachings that they have embraced heal the heart of my people slightly saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. In other words, the false prophets, their teachings and beliefs did not take sin seriously. Consequently, the false teachings lulled the nation into false security by ignoring repentance. Mm -hmm. This is why we see the prophet Jeremiah urging the Israelites to wake up and repent. Verses 16 of the same chapter, Jeremiah 6, 16. And it states, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where the good way um, is and walk in it, then you will find rest for your souls. The right choice always guarantees life and prosperity. The observance of the ethical and moral principles of the covenant will bring the highest spiritual blessing to individuals and to the nation. There is an irony in the biblical idea of repentance. Let me repeat it. There is an irony in the biblical idea of repentance. Progress often means going back. Progress often means returning. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3 verses 24 provides good news. When we repent, when we acknowledge our sin, when we feel genuinely sorry for it, and when we ask God's forgiveness for it, and ultimately turn away from it, God forgives. And we are, as it states in that verse, verse 24, justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Because we are sinful, repentance should be a central part of our Christian existence. In this week's lesson, we will study the structure of repentance, 
returning to God, which is an important principle in the book of Deuteronomy. The lesson this week explores the following themes. Seeking God, God's forgiveness, the return to God, and the fulfillment of prophecy. Mary, Mihetem, it's a great, great Hebrew word. What is the meaning of this idiom? Well, we're going to learn that this Hebrew phrase is in fact an idiom used in the Old Testament. And the phrase, mi ten, mi is the question, who? And ye ten means, will give. So its literal meaning is, who will give? Or, who will make it happen? However, in the Old Testament, it also expresses the idea of a profound desire, of a wish, of someone wanting something badly. Some examples of Miaten are found in the scriptures. One is, after the children of Israel escape Egypt and are then facing challenges in the wilderness, they exclaim, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. That's Exodus 16.3. The phrase, if only, came from Miaten. In the King James, this same verse reads, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord. Example number two. In Psalm 14.7, David utters, Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. The Hebrew doesn't say, Oh, it says, Me ten. It can also be read, who will give out of Zion the salvation of Israel? So with this Hebrew idiom in mind, we're going to read Deuteronomy 5, 27 to 29. Moses here is repeating their encounter on Mount Sinai and how the Israelites heard the voice of God from the darkness while the mountain burned and was on fire and they were afraid they'd be consumed so they asked Moses to go meet God in their stead verse 27 reads you go near and hear all that the Lord our God may say and tell us all that the Lord our God says to you and we will hear and do it then the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me and the Lord said to me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken to you. They are right in all that they have spoken. Oh, this is the word me attend, or who will give. He says, oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments that it might be well with them and with their children forever. So let's focus for a moment on this last verse where God makes this incredible statement. What is his wish, his intense desire, that they would have such a heart, a will, a determination, a mindset, character to respect and reverence him and always keep all his commandments. Why would he make such a statement? There are two very vital concepts we learn in this verse. First, they need a new heart. And second, freedom of choice or free will. God is reiterating the concept that they need to turn to him for a new heart. They had just stated in verse 27, tell us all that the Lord our God says, and we will hear and do it. And in verse 28, God says they are right in all that they have spoken. Their intentions are well and good, but they need someone to give them a new heart in order for them to follow through with this covenant, with this commitment. And God's saying, but you refuse to receive such a heart from me. 
who then can supply it? The second vital concept is that of free will or freedom of choice. This is made prominent in this verse. Here's our creator God who spoke everything into existence, created Adam, yet he's uttering a phrase generally associated with the weaknesses and limitations of humanity. Couldn't he just instantly give each of the Israelites a new heart in the twinkling of an eye? However, he doesn't because his love for us guarantees the reality of free will. Here we see that there are limits to what God can do in the midst of the great controversy. He chooses to limit himself. God's use of me attend reveals that even he can't trample on free will. For the moment he did, it would no longer be free. So what does God's statement mean to us today? God wants us to use our freedom of choice and to turn to him for a new heart. His deep desire is to give us such a heart that we'll always love and respect him and we'll want and be capable of keeping his commandments. And the result is that it will be well with us for eternity. It all starts with responding to the Holy Spirit to repent from our sins and follow him. Ultimately, the choice is ours and ours alone. And it's a choice we have to make day by day, moment by moment. In closing, I'd like to share these verses to encourage us in our daily choices. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Deuteronomy 36 says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts. And finally, Ezekiel 11.9 says, Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and take the stony heart out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh. Amen. Amen. Mary, thank you so much. It is really about a choice, repentance, it is. and returning to God, isn't it? Amen. Greg, Seek Me and Find Me is the title of Monday's lesson. And thank it's, a, for us. it's a great title. And good morning, everyone, again, and happy Sabbath. And as Victor had mentioned, this morning's lesson is titled Seek Me and Find Me. So let's start right out. If we look at the Bible, and all throughout the Bible, we find evidence or proof of God's foreknowledge throughout prophecies that he makes. And foreknowledge is God knowing all things, knowing future events that will take place, what choices we will make of our own free will. And that's very, very different than predestination. Mm -hmm. Foreknowledge is having the knowledge of our free will choices. But God still gives us the choices to make. And so God's examples of foreknowledge are really too numerous for us to cover in this brief lesson that we have. But let's just consider a few. If we begin with Genesis 15, 13, then he said to Abraham, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in the land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. And God prophesied that the Israelites would be enslaved for 400 years and then also that Israel would be taken captive to Babylon for 70 years in Jeremiah 25, 11 through 12. And all this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Mm -hmm. Then it will come to pass when the 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and the nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. Until this day, Babylon has not been rebuilt. Right. God also reveals in Daniel chapter 2 and 7 about the rise and fall of key world empires. Each of us could probably name some more examples of God's foreknowledge. What about the 2300 day prophecy? 
the 70 week prophecy, both from Daniel 8 and Daniel 9, or the 1,260 day prophecies, or Jesus telling Peter that he will deny him three times before the rooster crows in Matthew 26, 34. Also, what about Jesus telling the apostles he would be betrayed, or revealing to us in Revelation the history of the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets. So there is so much evidence of God's foreknowledge that he provides us with. So the question is, why does he do this? Well, the answer is, is so that by faith, we will seek him through his word, and that we can trust his word, that he is the one and only God who created us and who loves us. And he has the foreknowledge of events as expressed through his prophetic word, which is validated by the evidence of history. Amen. So as we go back to Deuteronomy, the Lord knew even before he brought the Israelites into the promised land that they would eventually, what they would eventually do. So let's look at a few verses here. Let's turn to our Bibles and go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 15 through 20. Take heed to yourselves, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, or the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, or the likeness of any fish that is in the water beneath the earth. And take heed, lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, the stars, all the host of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord has, your God has given to all the people under the whole heaven as a heritage. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt to be his people and inheritance as you are this day. So God specifically warns the Israelites not to make idols and to worship them, right? So now let's read a few verses later what God says will happen. And that's Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 25 through 28. When you beget children and grandchildren and have grown old in the land and act corruptly and make a carved image in the form of anything and do evil in the sight of the Lord your God to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will soon utterly perish from the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your, your days in it, but will utterly be destroyed. Mm. And the Lord will scatter you amongst the peoples, and you will be left few in number amongst the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve God's the work of men's hands, work of stone, wood, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. So God foretells exactly what's going to happen, what, what they will do. And they will make idols and worship them despite all the warnings. But notice in verse 25, through Moses, God tells them, he tells us, it won't happen immediately. Mm -hmm. But when their children and grandchildren have grown old in the land, that this will happen. That after a generation or so, mm -hmm. that they will forget what the Lord has done for them, and they will do exactly what he has warned them not to do. But despite all these warnings, the words of hope and opportunity, God tells the Israelites and us, and let's read just a little further. In fact, Victor had mentioned it in the opening. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29 through 31. And this is the grace of God. Let's read this. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if, the key word is if, you seek him with all your heart, with all your soul. When you are in distress, and all these things come upon you in the latter days, when you turn to the Lord your God and obey his voice, for the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore to them. So God's long suffering, his grace and mercy is amazing. Not only to the Israelites of old, but to us today as well. But 
even if the Israelites fall into horrific apostasy and idolatry, he will not forsake them nor destroy them again if, if they seek him, if they freely choose to seek him with all their heart and their soul. And later God tells us ultimately what's going to happen and what Israel will ultimately do in Deuteronomy 31.16. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers, and this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land where they go to be among them, and they will forsake me and break my covenant which I, has, which I have made with him. The term turn in Deuteronomy 4.30 in the Hebrew is the word shub. It's spelled S-U-B. It looks like sub, but it's pronounced shub. Mm -hmm. meaning return or return back to, return to the Lord. Also, the Hebrew word teshuva mm -hmm. comes from the same root word for return to, meaning repentance. So we're going to cover a little bit more in depth about repentance on Thursday. But in all their sinfulness and in our sinfulness today, what God is looking for in us is for our willingness to turn back to him based on our own free will, to seek him with all our heart and with all our soul and to repent of our sins, then we shall find him once again. Thank you, Greg. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. And thank you for introducing that word and explaining it because that's Teshuvah. absolutely what it is. Teshuva, a repentance that uh, really is part of a return to God. Amen. So very, very important. Um, all through the book of Deuteronomy, we see a key theme appear. If we obey the Lord, we will be blessed. If we disobey God, we will suffer the consequences. By the way, it, it's not different in the New Testament. Paul tells us in Galatians chapter uh, 6, verses 7 and 8, Galatians 6, 7 and 8, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap of everlasting life. Unfortunately, despite all the warnings and the promises, to sin seems to be as easy and as natural as to breed. It's just, mm -hmm. just unfortunate. It's just the way it is. That is why Moses tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11, for this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. These are encouraging words. What it really says is that it's not difficult to understand what God wants. You see, Many of the people fell into the sins that God had warned them about. You've just heard from, from Greg. He, in fact, the Lord predicted that they would. So Moses is telling the Israelites, he is telling you and I, that the covenant that the Lord has established with us is not too difficult to understand and to follow. I am just delighted that through Scripture, we see how God is passionately willing to uh, take Israel back, to take his people back, uh, when by their own free will, their own free choice, they repent and return to him. Amen. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, and we are going to spend um, quite a long, uh, a significant time in, in the significant time of my, my allotted time in Deuteronomy 30. So in Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 to 10, Moses describes the great mercies that God has promised those that repent and return to him. In these verses, God makes an appeal for repentance and a return to him. In return, God promises great blessings. See, let's read a few of these verses. As we do so, I would like you to note how the Lord calls for repentance and return. Amen. And there are three verses that, that all call for return and repentance but he does it in, in different ways. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 2, so verses 2 of chapter 30, God appeals for a return to the Lord your God, 
So let's read it. Return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. According to all that I commanded you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul. You see, here is what the Lord says he will do for his people if they repeat and return to him. We're going to read verses 3. We're going to read verses 5 and verses 6. So in verses 3 it says, The Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. You are now free. Liberty is given to you. He's bringing you out of captivity. Then in verses 5, The Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you and more than your fathers. So you will possess the land that God has promised, and you will be prospered. You will prosper even more than the fathers did. Verse 6, The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. You see, to circumcise the heart means to quicken one spirit, to open up the mind to accept the spirit. Quickens one spirit. Not only that, but it also uh, makes tender one's conscious so that you begin to really understand what's right and wrong. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33, the Lord tells us why we need to quicken our spirit, uh, our spiritual perception and make our conscious tender. Let's read it. Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant that I will make with Israel, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. The only way God can put the law in my mind and write it in the heart is when I have a spiritual perception of God and attend a conscience. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 8, God says to Israel, And you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I commanded you today. Well, this is a call for repentance and return to God. You see, to be able to obey the voice of the Lord and keep his commandments requires repentance and a return to God and turning to God daily in humility. Amen. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 10, God says, uh, God makes an appeal for Israel to turn to the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. Here is what the verse says. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in the book of life, or in the book of the law, my apologies, and you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. This is a call. This is a call for repentance and return to God. We can only turn to the Lord with all our heart and with all our soul when we repent and return to God. There is no other way. See, the message we find in these verses, verse 2, verse 8, and verse 7, these verses, is simple and straightforward. If you mess up, terrible consequences will result for us and for our family. That is just what sin does. However, the good news is that when we repent and return to the Lord, God will take us back and he will bless us. Amen. Writing on God's behalf to Israel, Moses ends Deuteronomy chapter 30 with this incredible appeal. And I'm going to read verses 19 and, 20. 19 and 20. I have set before you, says the Lord, to Israel. He's saying to you and to me today. I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursing. Therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days. Amen. God is your life and my life. 
To have our life inspired and directed by the love of God is to inherit eternal life. The possibilities of life for every human being are ultimately reduced to two choices. Two choices. One is to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. The end result is life in its fullness, ultimately merging into immortality, living perpetually with God. Amen. The alternative is a disregard for God, with our lives devoted to the things of this world, a life spent persistently dedicated to the things of this world leads to eternal death. It just makes sense to me to choose to love, to obey, and to cling to our life support, to our, life, to our Lord and Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Mary, <laughs> we are encouraged to return to the Lord with all our heart. Why is that important? Oh, it's so important. You know, the memory verse states, when Israel seeks the Lord in repentance and with all their heart, they will find him. That's, that's the mindset, that's the extent that we need in order to find him. It has to be with all of our heart. It just can't be something half-hearted or with this, oh, well, I'll give it a try. No, it has to be everything. So we just... Um, we were reading in Deuteronomy 30 about how God was constantly reminding his people to return to him, to turn to him. But they had gone astray. In these verses, again, we see God's grace and goodness towards backsliders and sinners, even when they were previously blessed by God in a very special way. For we read in Deuteronomy 4.7, it says, for what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason, we may call upon him. So remember, God dwelt among them in the tabernacle. Amen. He was there with them, and they could call upon him at any time. What a blessing and a privilege. No other nation had that advantage. They had no real justification or excuse for corrupting themselves, for making graven images and doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And despite all he had done for them, they sinned anyway. Can anyone relate? <laughs> so then what? Well, I'm going to reread Deuteronomy 30, verses 8 to 10. And you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand and the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock and in the produce of your land for good. Amen. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law. And if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So in verse 10, God is asking them to turn or return to him. What is he asking that they turn to him with? With all your heart and with all your soul. Why does God ask that of them? Why does it involve the heart? Because ultimately they had to make a choice. That's what we've been learning this week. A choice to return to him and obey, to, obey him with all their hearts. The real issue has to do with their hearts. If their hearts are right with God, their actions would follow and they would be obedient. So what does it mean to turn to him with all their, all their hearts? I'd like to share this quote from the book, Our Higher Calling. And it reads, God will be to us everything we will let him be. Oh, we need to press our petitions. Ask in faith, wait in faith, receive in faith, rejoice in hope, for everyone that seeketh findeth. 
Be in earnest in the matter. Seek God with the heart. People put soul and earnestness into everything they undertake in temporal things until their efforts are crowned with success. With intense earnestness, learn the trade of seeking the rich blessings that God has promised. And with persevering, determined effort, you shall have his light and his truth and his rich grace. In sincerity, in soul hunger, cry after God. Put your whole being into the Lord's hands, soul, body, and spirit, and resolve to be his loving, consecrated agency, moved by his will, controlled by his mind, infused by his spirit. Tell Jesus your wants in the sincerity of your soul. You're not required to hold a long controversy with or preach a sermon to God, but with a heart of sorrow for your sin. Say, save me, Lord, or I perish. There is hope for such souls. They will seek, they will ask, they will knock, and they will find. When Jesus has taken away the burden of sin that is crushing the soul, you will experience the blessedness of the peace of Christ. Wasn't that beautiful? Now, what a treasure trove of how to turn to God with our hearts and the results of turning to him completely. This is what God asked of ancient Israel, and he asks of us, spiritual Israel, today. We need to choose to follow him with all our heart, and if we do, his promise in return is... And this is from Deuteronomy 36. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. In the end, responding to God's promptings and turning to him with all their heart meant they would have to truly repent of their sins. In Patriarchs and Prophets, we read, True repentance is more than sorrow for sin. It's a res resolute turning away from evil. This is the truth stated in Deuteronomy 30. Thanks so much, Mary. Amen. There is no other option. The choice is ours. Is ours. Repent <laughs> and convert. Amen. Thank you, Victor. So Thursday's lesson is entitled, Repent and Be Converted. The verb repent in its various forms, repent, repented, repentance, I wonder if any of you can guess how many times it occurs in the Bible. Oh, Whew. I don't know. And it depends upon which version you're looking at yeah. and the database and how, if it groups them all together or not. But any idea, any guesses? A hundred. Ooh. Very close. 105 mm. times. Oh. That's what I came up with in there the search. 105 go. times from Genesis to Revelation, the principle of repentance mm -hmm. has been spoken by the Lord. Amen. So how important is repentance to the Lord? How important is this principle for us, for our salvation? Let's read 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So we're talking about a godly sorrow that produces repentance that leads to salvation. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John the Baptist was preaching repentance to prepare people, their hearts and their minds, for Jesus and for the kingdom. And if we read in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So, why does God relate repentance with the gospel? 
Well, if we think about it, the everlasting gospel is all about the love of God expressed through his plan of restoration and salvation through Jesus Christ. Repentance leads us to Jesus Christ, who leads us to salvation through him. And as we had mentioned on Monday, the Hebrew word for repent and turn in Scripture are, off, are often the same word in the Hebrew. And that Hebrew word is shub, as I had mentioned before. And meaning to return to God or to turn back to God and to repent. But they're often used together to convey the principle of turning away from sin and to return to God and to change one's mind for better to repent heartily, to amend with abhorrence of one's past sins. So an example of this is, let's read Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 6. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord, repent and turn away. Repent and turn away. Those are the same Hebrew word. From your idols and turn your faces away from all your abominations. So God is making sure to tell us that he wants us to repent, to turn away from sin, to turn back to him, to return to him. And in the New Testament, we've talked about the Old Testament Hebrew. In the New Testament, in the Greek, the term repentance is metanoia. And metanoia is, according to the Greek lexicon, it describes repentance as especially the change of mind of those who have begun to abhor their errors and misdeeds and have determined to enter upon a better course of life so that it embraces both a recognition of sin and sorrow for it mm -hmm. and hearty amendment, the tokens and effects of which are good deeds. But I love that so much that it's, it's bringing together the concept of recognition of sin and sorrow for it. Mm -hmm. That's one thing to, to repent or to say, I'm sorry. Do you have sorrow for it? We're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a moment here. Um, the root word for the term repentance in the Greek is metaneo. It's a little bit different of a word. It goes a little deeper here. It's a change of mind as it appears to one who repents of a purpose he has formed or of something he has done or conduct worthy of a heart changed and a boring sin. So as Mary had mentioned before and Victor has mentioned before, this is a heart change. That's what repentance is. It is a heart change. Jesus tells us to seek him as a hidden treasure. And in understanding the Hebrew and the Greek terms, because oftentimes the English language doesn't adequately describe the intensity exactly. of, of a principle that is being expressed. And so when you search for this and the Lord leads you to this, that's a hidden piece of treasure that, that really fits spot on with that principle. And God wants us to understand what repentance is all about and ultimately how it relates to the two greatest commandments that sum up the Ten Commandments. Repentance, as we said, it's about a heart change conversion and restoration and in a practical sense repentance is a gift from God to help us not only to turn away from sin but it helps us to better understand how destructive sin is and how sin hurts and separates us from God first and foremost and how sin hurts others true repentance ultimately makes us abhor how sin causes pain and separation from God and those whom we offend. So repentance also helps us to understand, this is another side of it, that I know the Lord has helped me to understand when I have asked him specifically, Lord, help me to really understand repentance. Mm -hmm. I understand it's a heart change, but what else? What else are you trying to teach me? Mm -hmm. And it's also teaching us about lost opportunities. Mm -hmm. Lost opportunities where we can love and serve the Lord and our neighbor. It doesn't mean that we can't do that going forward. 
But that's part of that aberrance of sin is the pain and destructiveness that it caused that we could have done good. We could have done good things to serve and love the Lord and for our fellow man, but we lost those opportunities. And that's what gets inside of us and just abhors sin and wants us to turn away and to turn to the Lord. So keep in mind, repentance is a gift from God that helps us to turn away from sin and that leads us to salvation, as 2 Corinthians 7.10 says. Then we can wholly reply, rely upon the merits of Jesus Christ, that he may convert us, he may restore us and our hearts to him. So let me ask you a question, and I'll ask you guys this question too. Can we be saved without repentance? <laughs> well, can we be saved without repentance, without turning away from sin and returning to God? I find that the answer is pretty straightforward Absolutely. in God's word. Mm -hmm. The answer is no. We all need to pray daily, every single one of us. We need to pray daily and ask the Lord not only to forgive our sins, but ask him for the gift of repentance for the sins that we have made so that our hearts, that our minds, our words, and our actions will be converted and restored back to him. Amen. That was Thursday's lesson. Thanks so much, Greg. Pleasure. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. Really wonderful to be able to, to unpack this repentance, which is so, so necessary for Amen. us. For final thoughts and an appeal here this morning, I, um, I want to bring you back to three or four verses here and, and passage with, from Christ's subject lessons. And I want to make a sincere appeal to you to consider accepting God's call and following Him. Amen. You see, throughout Scripture, and that includes both the Old and the New Testament, we can see clearly that Jesus, He took a close and personal interest in His people. And you and I claim to be His people. And was often present to comfort, to intervene, to challenge, and to protect. Jesus is our creator and redeemer. Did not live, leave humanity alone. Today he's asking you, and he's asking, my, he's asking me, to seek him with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. A little while ago, you read Isaiah chapter 50, 55, verse 6. I'm going to reread that and add verse 7 to, to that. And it simply says this to you and to me. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And then verse 7 says... Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Amen. Amen. Then Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 7, tells us, I will give them to know me. I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people. And I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart, a renewed heart. Yes. It's an amazing God we serve. Yes. I know it's tough sometimes to make that call and say, Lord, forgive me. I want to be yours, totally yours. But the God is asking us to do so. Ellen G. White in Christ's Object Lessons, pages, page 202, 202 tells us, the love of God yearns over the one who has chosen to separate from him. And he sets in operation influences to bring him back to the Father's house. Every time I read this statement, I, f I feel emotional mm -hmm. because I know that I have very close family 
that are not godly at this stage. Amen. And to know that God chooses to do any, everything possible for those is just yeah. very, very touching. He does it for you. He does it for me. Then Sister White goes on and says, the prodigal found hope in the conviction of his father's love. It was that love which was drawing him toward home. So it is the assurance of God's love that constrains the sinner to return to God. And then she continues, same page, and she says, the goodness of God leads us to repentance. She's quoting Romans chapter 2, verses 4. And pay attention. She says, A golden chain, the mercy of compassion and divine love, is passed around every imperiled soul. The Lord declares, Jeremiah 31, 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Again, I will build you and, your, and you shall be rebuilt. I will build you and you shall be rebuilt. Amen. I want to re end with this incredible passage of Scripture. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 and 3. This is the last sentence of verse, verse 1 and chapter 3. This really talks to me, and I hope it talks to you. Fear not, Victor. Fear not. For I have redeemed you. At Calvary, he redeemed us. Amen. I have called you by your name. Victor, I'm calling you. Mary, I'm calling you. Greg, I'm calling you. You are mine. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Amen. What an incredible God we serve. Amen. And all he is doing is to get us to pay attention and with our free will return to God, repent of our ways, and have us transformed so that we can love him with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. And as we do that, we will love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I am just delighted. Delighted, Lord, that you love us with, with an agape love that goes beyond any understanding and comprehension. I want to thank you, Father, that even before we were created, you had already an answer to us have chosen to go wrong. And Lord, you came to this earth and that Calvary on that terrible cross, dying a terrible death, you liberated us from the condemnation of sin. And now, Lord, you are telling us, I have made a place for you. I want you to be with me. And you will have everything that you ever wished. Just choose to return to me and to repent so that I may transform your heart so you may be able to love me with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace. Amen. We want to be yours, Lord. We want to serve you. We want to be born servants. We want to be used by you. Lord, take our will and mold it into yours. Help us to die for self every day. And Father, every day, help us with a Transform character to reflect your light, to reflect, reflect your goodness, your truth, and Lord, to reflect your character. Amen. For we ask it in Jesus' name.
Amen. 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 Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath.